Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Sharon Bonney. I am the CEO for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Move ahead with economics, personal finance, and entrepreneurship, real world, world integration activities. This webinar is generously sponsored by Essential Education, which is Coop's corporate partner and corporate sponsor. So I'm gonna stop sharing my video here and introduce you to Dr. Dan Griffith, who's gonna share a few words on behalf of Essential Education. Dan, Dan. Thank you, Sharon, appreciate it. Let me just uh, share my screen real quick. There we go. Uh, we sure appreciate the opportunity we have to work with Coab in so many different facets and to have the opportunity to share these uh, sponsorship of these wonderful sessions that they're putting on. And, and we're so excited to be back with people uh, at the conference coming up in March. Just a couple of things uh, about essential education with respect to financial literacy we wanted to address. Um, we uh, have a variety of courses that would be appropriate uh, for workplace development. And one of the things that we worked really hard on is to make sure that all of our content is adaptive. So it meets the learner exactly where they are and tries to fill in gaps rather than make them slog through a lot of content. Um, we've done a great deal of work around accessibility to make sure that students of all uh, types are able to access our content. So it's 508 compliant. I'm glad to get you copies of our VPAT if that's interesting to you or something you would like to see. And then mobile ready, it allows for 24 seven 24 access from any device with an internet connection. Uh, we've really tried to design things so that they look right on a screen and work correctly on the screen. And so we're excited about what um, we are able to offer students uh, so that they can work at, at their pace and in times that are convenient for them. Uh, we do have a variety of courses that are available from our computer essentials course that is digital literacy uh, content. We also have a new distance education course uh, program learning guide that we're launching here in probably February that'll be out. And we have a money essentials course and a work essentials course. So we're excited to be able to offer these uh, aspects to kind of round out a student's adult ed experience, uh, not just our academic content, but content that will help learners reach their goals and create the quality of life that they're interested in. So if you're interested in any of these, you can contact us at info at essentialed.com. We're always glad to set up a demo for people and let you kick the tires and uh, try the programs out on your own. And uh, we'll turn it back over to you, Sharon. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's great to hear about the products that you have, all the ways you're helping our adult learners. So I would like to take a minute here to introduce today's webinar presenter. And while I do this, I see some folks are introducing themselves in the chat box, chat box which is great. You can go ahead and do that and post your questions to q and I'm going to actually read this so I make sure I get everything. Starting her career as a career and technical education high school teacher and cooperative education coordinator, Dr. Cheryl Ayers has more than 20 years of experience in creating and delivering customized professional development programs, undergraduate and graduate university courses, in curricula and economics, personal finance, and entrepreneurship. Her research and scholarship focuses on teaching economics in an accessible and multidisciplinary way that empowers individuals for more productive and prosperous lives as consumers, employees, business owners, and citizens with an emphasis on economic reasoning skills and tools used to make informed decisions. She recently published the first research-based theory of effective economics instruction at the secondary level. Dr. Ayers also currently serves as the director of the Center for Economic Education at Virginia Tech. And she also will be holding a wonderful course in the future that she'll be sharing about in a minute as well. But with that, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Cheryl Ayers. Dr. Cheryl? All right, thank you so much, Sharon. I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen ready. Let's see if, um, pull this up. Welcome everyone. It's great to see um, people from all over the country. I told Sharon uh, yesterday that I was so excited about today's webinar that I didn't think I was gonna sleep very well and I was right. So let's see here. Cher, do you see my screen? I do. Yep. 
however we just see that yeah we need there you go is that is that good yep perfect Okay, and, and thank you to our sponsor that certainly makes or breaks a program oftentimes. So I appreciate you all um, spending your afternoon or wherever you're uh, calling in from with us today. So we'll get started right away. I'm so glad I don't have to introduce myself. Thank you for that generous introduction, Sharon. Um, this curricula that I've developed in today's program is also something that's come out of my own entrepreneurial endeavors called the Economic Empowerment Project, and that's something we'll talk about towards the end of today's time together, and I'm still an economics professor at Virginia Tech. Go Hokies! So if you remember from the um, description, what we're going to do today is I want to talk about content and pedagogy in terms of how we can integrate economics, personal finance and entrepreneurship, those are my disciplinary backgrounds. Um, integrate them in a way that helps you teach the core academic subjects, math, English, science and social studies. I actually do a similar webinar for K-12 teachers. And so it works beautifully across really K-16 grades. And the other thing that we'll want to do is, in particular, talk about how the economic reasoning skills and tools can be integrated not only across multidisciplinary subjects, but also through Life 101 experiences. So hopefully we'll have um, takeaways in terms of how you might implement these uh, field tested resources in your classroom tomorrow, but also to help your adult learners um, improve the quality of their lives. So at the end of this, I will share a um, link to a Google folder that will have all sorts of field tested, customizable activity sheets, some of which I'll go over with you today. And then I've also over the last couple of years collected about a 17 page document um, containing all sorts of other free, free is always the operative word, um, resources for teaching these three subject areas. So in a nutshell, my goal is always has to be multi-purpose. So this, our goal today is three in one. The first thing is I hope to give you um, helpful ways, make your life a little bit easier, but to increase the comprehension on core academic subjects so that they can pass, for example, the GED exam. So, you know, while you're having to teach those subjects anyway, it just makes sense that maybe you could use um, some of these real world subject areas to have um, a greater impact. The other thing is, as I've mentioned, is these tools and resources that I'll share with you today also help in personal decision making so that those decisions are more informed, hence more empowered. And that will just hopefully improve the quality of life for the people you serve. The other piece is at the same time, believe it or not, these subject areas and these resources and these techniques for instruction also prepare um, your adult learners for the workforce. So those employability skills that we want all people to have, not just ones that might go on to start a business. However, oftentimes these resources culminate in maybe a side hustle. And by that, I mean just a part-time job. Uh, maybe it's dog walking, maybe it's um, driving for Grubhub, maybe it's an Uber driver. So something that would help someone increase their income when, let's face it, sometimes you can't decrease expenses to balance that budget. So to always have that in your back pocket on how if I get in a pinch, rather than, for example, go to a payday loan um, service, how about I just make some money temporarily or long term, maybe it becomes a full time career. And we know when people are able to be rewarded for their efforts through compensation, doing what they love, ideally, that increases job satisfaction, which, of course, leads to job retention. So what we'll do throughout this is. Um, we will have opportunities for me to share some examples of multidisciplinary real world contexts, again, that I hope you'll be able to integrate into your classroom instruction. But then also always putting on the other hat of now, how do we use the same content and the same resources to make better life decisions as consumers, as perhaps entrepreneurs, employees of someone else's business, as citizens, voters, within your own family unit, self-management, et cetera. So we always want to take a look at, at the end of the presentation of the content and the resources, I'll ask you from examples um, for how you might integrate this into your classroom as well as help your um, 
adult learners in their personal lives. So I'll say and somewhat apologize, I originally um, had hoped to do breakout groups. That's kind of how I roll. I, as an economics professor, try never to talk at my students for two hours, sort of like I'm going to have to do with you today, only because, and I was thrilled to hear we had so many people signed up for this webinar, but it doesn't really work as well um, when we have so many people in terms of debriefing through a shared Google Doc. I like to use Google Jamboard. If you haven't used Jamboard, it's awesome. In terms of debriefing on one page online. Um, it's all free. So instead, perhaps if you're interested, we could have a follow up in a couple of weeks after you have time to process all of the information I'm going to give you today. And I'm just going to warn you, it's going to be overwhelming. But I did the cost benefit analysis. And as I was taking out some of the interaction pieces that I typically do, I was like, okay, well, let me pack it with more content, just in case you're not able to join us again, or perhaps some of the programs I'll share with you that you might sign up for. If you don't have time, and I get it, we're all running short on time, it seems these days, you'll at least have enough to really have this um, toolkit of empowerment resources to integrate across your classes and programs. So today, unfortunately, or there are participants that sometimes don't like to be overly interactive and they prefer what we're going to do today and that is there'll be times when I'll ask you to share out and if you'll use the chat box for that and then any questions that I can answer at the end of the webinar that can wait um, go ahead and pop those into the Q&A um, place okay so that's our game plan Again, I will share this with you um, probably at break and then at the end again, but it has about 10 or so resources that I'm getting ready to go over, so don't get nervous. Um, you'll have access to these 80 some PowerPoint slides as well. My job is to always give you everything you need that requires as little um, prep time as possible so that what you experience here today, you quickly turn around and um, share with your students with some modifications depending on your population, but meanwhile, you're also learning the, the content or reviewing it for some of you. So Sharon, we had three polls we were going to run. I love to get to know the audience. And unfortunately, this online is somewhat impersonal. But I would love to just know your background. Um, are you able to pull up that poll? I have it right here. And I'll go ahead and I see poll one, which best describes your opinion about the importance. Okay, great. We'll launch that now. Okay. So how important do you think it is for adults to learn a basic, that's the operative, basic understanding of real world applications of economics, personal finance, and entrepreneurship? And be honest, this is anonymous. Looks like we have a full response. I'll share the results right now. Okay. You know, this question always helps me know how much quote unquote selling I need to do. So it sounds like a lot of you are already convinced, hence the reason you probably joined us today, okay? What's the other one? They're a little bit out of order from my PowerPoint slides, so don't look at what's on the PowerPoint screen. Can you um, bring up the next one, Sharon? Yes. Hold on one second here. Okay. Okay, so depending sometimes on how important you think something is dictates to how often you do it, not always, just sometimes. So which of these best describes how often? Now I'm just, I'm just interested in how often you're able to uh, teach these three subjects. Often, sometimes, or rarely, never. And it may not be because you don't think they're important. Maybe it's just because you teach something unrelated, which my goal today is to, to show you how these three subjects are related to almost everything. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so 20% often, 50% sometimes, and about a third rarely or never, okay? Good to know. Hopefully, um, the end of this, we can up some of those rarely to never numbers. All right, and the last one is the first one, which is where are you coming from? Adult ed, workforce development, correctional, or higher ed, or other? It's nice to know who I'm talking with. And Dr. Ayers, I'm not sure that that was included. I'm not seeing that here in the poll. Okay, no okay. problem. But Sharon, I think you said the majority of your members or participants in these webinars are typically adult ed related? Yes, ma'am. So they are mostly adult education and 80% of them are teachers. Perfect. All right. Well, good to know. Let's go ahead and get started into more of the content. But before I do, I just want to give you the short version on how I started this as an entrepreneur. So this is what I do in my free time. It is my labor of love. It's why I wake up in the morning. But unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time outside of my day job to spend on it. So hence, I'm not doing as much as I would like for now. But so here's a um, long story short. So I have legislate in Virginia, the high school requirement that all high school students have to take the economic semester, personal finance semester in 2009, went on to train Virginia's teachers. By the way, I'm calling in from Charlottesville, Virginia. So the whole time I'm thinking, because we didn't have a lot growing up. My mom was an immigrant, didn't speak any English when she brought me and my brother to the United States. And I'm thinking, what about the people who don't have that high school requirement? Or even when I graduated from high school, I didn't have to take economics and personal finance. What about those people um, who didn't have the opportunity? Because while this is a wonderfully economic opportune nation, if you don't understand the basics of the economy and your roles in it, you can hardly take advantage of those economic freedoms leading to what we call economic empowerment. So I just have been chewing on this for years and I thought, let me do something in, in, in a small way to help out. So the goal of this economic empowerment project is to help in particular, not the college educated, but preferably adults with limited education and income, learn these three disciplines at their very basics, because these are the people, like when I was growing up, we didn't have time to um, learn by trial and error when it came to finances, for example. We lived paycheck to paycheck, and if we didn't have smart spending um, decisions, it just so happens that my parents did pretty good with their money, we were the ones that suffered. It's not the ones who don't you know, even have to worry about their bank balance in terms of paying bills. It's these people that I think you all serve that need this information yesterday so that they too can make better decisions for themselves and then others, including their family members. And so in some small way, and this is maybe pie in the sky for me, but it's what it keeps me going. Um, in some small way, I hope through these resources and these programs that we are able to reduce poverty. Um, I live, uh, I work at Virginia Tech. It's a highly rural population um, and stimulate some economic growth through in particular entrepreneurship in the area that I serve across the United States. And so I'm so thankful for COEB to have partnered with me in this project that I started a couple years ago um, and bring this on a national scale. And so, Here's, here's the secret sauce. So what happens is people take economics um, or hear about economics in the news and they're just like, oh my gosh, this is so over my head. This is so not relevant to my day-to-day -day lives. And that um, is the problem. And so my research, in fact, that first theory is how do we take pretty basic economics and make it accessible so that it improves the lives of everyday people, not people getting a degree in economics. And so while I have spent many years teaching high levels of theoretical economics, I'm slowly um, transitioning into taking this discipline that is so, so powerful and now bringing it to people who can actually make better decisions for themselves um, and their families. And so what we're going to see here is this economic content that we'll go over briefly and in particular, the three tools, cost benefit analysis, PASTO decision making model, and these economic way of thinking principles, all of which we're going to talk about today. How can contextualizing personal finance and entrepreneurship, how can we make better decisions in personal finance and entrepreneurship by using economics as the lens through which we make those decisions? And that 
is makes all of the difference. Not only between an average economics teacher and a rock star economics teacher, but between making ordinary personal finance decisions, for example, and making ones that really have an impact on someone's well being. And you'll see really quick, I always kind of use entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship interchangeably because the same skills that go for an entrepreneur go for an entrepreneur who works for someone else's business. So, you know, we're at a place now in this innovation gig economy where even if you never start your own business, you will be that employee who gets the promotion, gets the employee of the month, kudos. If you're able to understand how that business operates and you do that through entrepreneurship. So it's a beautiful um, kind of overlap in not only preparing a person to have that rainy day back pocket skill set in case push comes to shove and they have to start a part time job just to make ends meet and all actually being that rock star employee at someone else's business. And so that's sort of the beauty behind entrepreneurship. So I'm not gonna go over these topics in particular. We're gonna to touch on the ones I tell you. So each of these courses could be a semester course. In fact, within economics, I teach micro, macro, and international, which are three separate semester courses. So I painstakingly have determined what the very basics based on 20 years of teaching it, what the bare bones basics are in terms of these three disciplines. And it was painful, I'll just say though, but these are the topics that we're going to touch on today, but is also in this 12 hour curriculum and training you'll have an opportunity to to sign up for if you'd like and the entrepreneurship institute that coed has so graciously sponsored and we'll, we'll talk about that at the end as well and make sure you have that information. So, and the, the second objective, if you'll remember, is I want to talk about the sweet spot where all of these subject areas, including social studies, English, science, and life 101 intersect with what we call the real world critical thinking skills, which you can hardly have a job anymore without having to demonstrate some of these employability skills, regardless of whether you start a business or not, how they intersect with economics. And that is where the power comes in. The three economic reasoning tools, which I'll just quickly demonstrate for you and ask for some applications. Remember, multidisciplinary life 101. This is the game changer. Not only for um, increasing comprehension in academic subjects, but for having a better life. And I know it sounds so um, uh, over idealistic, but it isn't because you'll see another piece I wrote. Um, this is all grounded in my own research, which of course is situ situated in 50 years of literature from other uh, economists who have done similar studies. And so this definitely works. Because in a nutshell, you know, thinking like an economist or studying economics, and here's where we've gone wrong as economists. We've taught it in such a way that's so so worthy of being called the dismal science as it unfortunately is referred to is because we haven't done a good job teaching it. And so when we teach economics as a um, subject area that makes people happier because it's simply the study of getting the most out of life, period. And when you understand economics in that way, therein lies the power. And Bill Gates, who is not an economist, had this to say. Take a look and read that. So we're not suggesting that you, you know, even take a semester course in economics, although I bet a lot of you have, but if you're like me, you can barely remember it because it wasn't taught in a very accessible way. But certainly just having these thinking skills um, can make the difference. So I'm gonna uh, be quiet here. I want you to read through, this is what my research has shown, these three tools that we're gonna jump into here in just a second. These are the student learning outcomes that um, come from using something as simple as a cost benefit analysis. Quickly read through that list. OK. 
Okay, it's okay if you haven't finished. Again, I'm gonna share these PowerPoint slides with you. Probably makes sense to come back to this because you haven't already buckled up. Now's the time to do it because we are gonna move as fast as possible because in, in, my, in my own good conscience, I thought I wanna give you <clears throat> as much as possible in this short time together and then come back and process it, read through this. But look at the first three, sharpening critical thinking and critical literacy skills, right? Now more than ever, you need critical literacy skills with all of the media that bombards our minds daily. Multiple perspectives. You cannot fill out a cost benefit analysis without bringing in those social studies, multiple perspectives. And then back to the academic core uh, subjects, you can gain a deeper, more nuanced understanding of anything that you apply, for example, a cost benefit analysis chart to. Look down at number seven, articulating and defending positions using content vocabulary. I know that's important for some of that GED instruction. And finally, number 15, simply making more productive and prosperous workplace and everyday life decisions. So I, I just really encourage you to come back to this and really look at how you can use what we're getting ready to go over in your uh, profession to achieve some of these learning outcomes. <clears throat> and I'll just share, I, I know you're we're from all over the place, but in Virginia, we have included these um, tools into our standards of learning because we know they also culminate in the five C's, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, creative thinking, and citizenship skills as well as hits all of the things we hope our Virginia graduates leave us with, which is content knowledge, workplace skills, community and civic responsibility and career planning. The reason I share it with you is because I'm pretty sure all states have something similar. <coughs> I have included a document that takes this curricula and um, crosswalks it with some of the national college and career readiness standards. So be looking for that document when you receive the link to the Google Drive folder. There's also a video here um, that's hyperlinked, so come back and watch it. This is um, a lady I work with. She's about two hours south of me. <clears throat> She's an adult education instructor, and she has used these resources, this curriculum, in the following ways um, that you can come and look at it. She's created a 16-minute video talking about how you can use what we learned together today in that GED classroom in particular. And the whole premise behind, in, in case you haven't noticed, I, I'm pretty um, easily excitable, especially about things that I love, which this is the thing I love most, what we're doing here together. <clears throat> this whole idea of empowerment, that's not just a, a word that I you know, slapped into the title of my business, uh, consulting business, but it's because all of these subjects and resources are intended to motivate. Think about you know, a student that you have in your classroom that maybe never heard um, a positive reinforcement that, hey, you can do it. You can get the GED. You can have a, a fulfilling career. <clears throat> so when I do this in, in, in person, I'm even more animated, which I'm really, I promise, trying to tone it down for you all here today. <clears throat> the whole point here is that to teach your um, learners that they are the economy. It's not just for the 1% in our nation. They are the economy. But again, you have to understand economics to be able to take advantage of those privileges and that they have a voice, they have choices, they have control <clears throat> and they can change their future. Let me get a sip of water here. As I said, I rarely talk this much nonstop. I've actually got some cough drops if I need them. So I apologize for having to clear my throat constantly. <clears throat> All right, let's do it. Any pressing questions that cannot wait? Okay, let me see how I'm doing on time. We're gonna take a nice 10 minute break right around three o'clock. So hang with me. <clears throat> so you're gonna get in the Google folder a um, one page graphic organizer that will summarize the basics of economics in about 10 minutes or less. I'm gonna fly through this. I encourage my K-16 students to review this every year as the teacher and as the student, because this is going to be the framework that is gonna set us up for those more empowered personal finance decisions and those more empowered entrepreneur, entrepreneur decisions. So just sit back and relax for this. Uh, but again, you'll have this 
activity sheet, and then you can uh, use it with your students. So let me go through it pretty quickly. So we know that every nation has four types of resources, meaning that those are the things that they use to produce other things, so productive resources. <clears throat> now the group of resources that come from the earth, unaltered by man, like the tree there, we call natural, People's knowledge, skills, talents, and ethics, I like to include ethics, we call human or labor. And those man-made resources used over and over and over and over in production, they never become part of the product like nails would, but like a hammer used to make desk after desk after desk after desk if you're a carpenter. We call that capital. Now let's take a look at the chat box. Who knows what the fourth resource is uh, and these are the people who take the risk to start a business <clears throat> by organizing natural human and capital resources in a way that makes a profit. Can you put in the chat box who you think that resource is? <clears throat> and Sharon, let me, I'm gonna take this cough drop. Let me know what you're seeing. I am seeing the word entrepreneurs. That's exactly right. <clears throat> Goodness entrepreneurs. So think about it. Every nation has these four resources <clears throat> to varying degrees. So India, for example, a lot of human resources. Germany, I'm German, a lot of capital resources that go into making those BMWs, for example. <clears throat> Africa, a lot of natural resources in terms of diamonds, for example. The U.S. is blessed with a nice variety of all of these. So these resources are combined in various ways to produce two types of products, <coughs> goods and services. However, here's where the rub comes into play. <clears throat> Productive resources, therefore the goods and services that they go on to make are limited. Goodness, Sharon, hold on. <coughs> mm. This is the last thing you want to happen as a presenter. However, the human wants, in theory, we can never get enough are unlimited. And so when you have limited resources colliding with unlimited human wants, it creates the whole impetus for economics. The whole reason we study economics is because of this S word, scarcity. <clears throat> so whenever you're backed into the corner because of scarce resources, <clears throat> the three main decision makers in the economy, which would be consumers, hence the personal finance content we're gonna go over today, producers, entrepreneurship, and then the government. So whenever you're talking about scarcity experienced by any of these three players in the economy, you're talking about economics. <clears throat> so now, when we talk about the best ways to use the resources, we always have to make economic choices. And this is what I want you to put in the uh, chat box. Every single time without fail, no exceptions to the rule. Every time you make a choice, you incur this, a blank cost, two words. What is the first word? A blank cost. And Dr. Ayers, we're seeing the word opportunity. Wow, that's exactly right. In fact, we were successful in getting this in our second grade standards of learning for Virginia because it is that important. <clears throat> so opportunity costs. Now let's unpack that for a minute. Look at what we've got here. So every time you make a choice, let's look at it backwards. It costs you the opportunity. It's not, so the word cost is um, a misconception. It is sometimes money, but more times than not, it's not money. So by being here today, you've made an economic choice to invest in your human capital, <clears throat> but it is costing you the opportunity to do something else, to be somewhere else, right? So what you need to do, an opportunity cost is always your second favorite alternative foregone, given up when you make a choice. So I would ask you if we're in person, what would you be doing if you weren't listening in on this webinar? 
not what are all the things you could be doing. It's what would you be doing? What's your second favorite alternative that you gave up to be here today? Because it cost you something. And that then would be your opportunity cost. <clears throat> So in conclusion, I wanna wrap this up because this gets into more of the civics and economics, but <clears throat> this basic economic problem of scarcity requires nations to answer three basic questions. <clears throat> what goods and services they will produce, how the goods and services will be produced, and then who gets them. And depending on where you live in the world, we'll answer those questions. So if you look on the right there, if you're in a command economy, the government answers these three questions for the people. And this is theoretical, so exceptions to all rules. <clears throat> In the United States, we're still predominantly a market economy, although we do have things like public education that the government makes decisions about. But generally speaking, when consumers and producers, when they vote for products by using their dollars to pay for them, we tell producers, hey, make more of this, or hey, you need to go out of business, creative destruction, what we call it. <clears throat> when the consumers and producers through their interaction in the marketplace through supply and demand answer these questions, uh, you've got the, a market economy. But we typically know that most countries have what's called a mixed economy, taking a little bit from both extremes. And in conclusion, whenever the social goal of an economy and social goals are different, in the United States, we value efficiency. Having grown up in Germany, they value more equality and equity. So the social goals of an economy determine a lot. And we forget that when we try to compare the US to other countries. But in our country, we like efficiency, productivity, GDP. And that requires specialization and interdependence. And whenever you have a nation of people specializing and relying on other people to meet the needs that they're unable to produce, we need what's called trade. So that's economics 101 in a nutshell. This I would argue would be the bare basics that all adult learners should understand. And so hopefully that's helpful. And in conclusion, here's what I want, if nothing else for you to leave our webinar <clears throat> today realizing is that economics is simply, and this is why we teach it in elementary grades, including kindergarten, the study of choices, made by those three players, because economics is a social science, studies human behavior, but because we don't wanna study sociology or psychology, we have to put some parameters on the study of choices. And we're gonna remember choices made by consumers, producers, and the government. And you can also say economics is simply the science of decision-making under scarcity. So when you hear that, um, that cliche, there's no such thing as a free lunch, well, what we're talking about is opportunity cost. So for example, with the producers in mind, if an entrepreneur, say, hires another employee, that will cost them the opportunity to, for example, raise salaries of existing employees. For a consumer, if you go after that, buy one, get one free, great, fine, but it costs you the opportunity to put that money into your piggy bank savings account. The government, same thing. You have a plot of land that you have to decide how you're gonna use it. If you make the decision to build a new uh, police station, for example, you can't build the public library on top of the same land. So creating a new police department costs you the opportunity to build the library. I hope you'll come back and watch these two videos uh, when you have more time, especially the second one, it will just like seal the deal for you, I hope. I'm not gonna go into this because the St. Louis Fed has this wonderful video on this entrepreneur named Alice. She starts a diner. <clears throat> and so what I did is I took this macroeconomics, and remember this is a whole semester course in, on one page. This macroeconomic course, this is called the circular flow of money and economic activity in a market economy. And it will walk you through each of these pieces. So in your resource packet online through Google folders, you'll have a blank form like this, and then you'll have the answer key, which I've shown you here. <clears throat> but this is um, a explanation of the relationships of the main players in an economy. So market one, the market for resources, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurs. Market two, the market for goods and services like you'd buy at Walmart. Then you've got the two um teams 
you've got uh, the first set of decision makers, which are the businesses in our economy and or entrepreneurs. You know, entrepreneurs start about uh, offer two out of every three new jobs in this country. So no small player. And then you've got the households. <clears throat> and that's where we make some of those personal finance decisions. So I, um, I really encourage you to go back, unpack this for yourself, probably watch the video a couple of times. <coughs> hmm. And then share bits and pieces. You can um, alter this as you see fit. <clears throat> I brought in the international market just because it's a good idea to have an overview of imports and exports. And I put in the middle because the government and the banks or financial intermediaries are also players in the economy. But this is it. <clears throat> you know, economics uses models because it is so complex. I mean, think about the economy out in the real world. So many moving parts. I mean, just think about the stock market on how those prices are set. It's all based on these relationships and interactions within the economy. And I'm not going to go into this, although this is one of my favorite subjects, <clears throat> but a basic understanding of supply and demand is critical for consumers and entrepreneurs. <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be complicated. And for those people who understand the um, concepts of supply and demand through verbal uh, qualitative ways like reading the definitions great <clears throat> but please don't rob your students of the opportunity to learn these concepts mathematically which for me like when I read about supply and demand it doesn't make a lot of it, well it does now after all these years but in the beginning it didn't I learn better through this mathematical manipulation of a graph and so just know that there are left brain people and right brain people <clears throat> so don't shy away from these graphs um, and, and perhaps we can do another webinar. It is in the, the curriculum that I've written and the training you could take advantage of, but you really want to get a grasp because first of all, it's beautiful math 101, but it really helps inform <clears throat> consumers and producers and understand current events, why prices, why we now have a 7% inflation rate as of yesterday, et cetera. Okay, <clears throat> let's see how we're doing. I'm gonna get a big um, spoonful of honey at the break. All right, we've got about 15 minutes. <clears throat> so the three economic reasoning tools, this is kind of the bulk of what I wanna do with you here today in terms of economics. So let's just quickly go through this. You'll have these three activity sheets. These are those three powerhouse tools that you can <clears throat> use on a dime's notice. And remember, it has that long list of learning outcomes for students like critical thinking. So we're going to go through these one by one. I'm going to give you some examples. And then I want you to give me, remember, as we go through this, think to yourself. <clears throat> all right, what is it that I teach? What classes or programs do I deliver where I could use each of these tools? In particular, we'll just focus on the first two. So tool number one, cost benefit analysis. <clears throat> Here's what the handout looks like. If you'll notice in the green, where this is a little bit different than maybe what you've seen before is we're gonna add some quantitative measures to this qualitative analysis. We're gonna put some numbers to it, very simple numbers, but the numbers is what will make the difference. <clears throat> so now this tool, unlike the next two tools, this is when you want to do an in-depth analysis of one choice one alternative, not all the different things you can buy or all the different vacation places you can go. This is where you pick one and you really unpack it. <clears throat> Typically, it's good to remember it's kind of to do or not to do something. And the important thing to help your students is to make sure they have a short term perspective kind of here in the next few days and a long term down the road, those intended and unintended consequences. Make sure all of that is packed into this little T-chart for a very rich and robust analysis. Because remember, <clears throat> informed <clears throat> decisions equal empowered decisions. The more informed you are in making a decision, hopefully the better that decision will be for you. Again, as I mentioned, multiple perspectives naturally are integrated 
You can't help but include multiple perspectives and a cost benefit analysis. And we're gonna add some weight. So because not all costs and all benefits are equally important. And I'll just encourage you to know that um, or look at your curricula because these cost benefit analyses can be applied to historical events as well. So it's not just future decisions, it can be in the past too. So let's do a quick example. Let's use a personal finance example. We want, we have a choice. We want to know, should we go to the beach for a long weekend or not? Assuming it's summertime. <clears throat> so the scale is one through 10. This is arbitrary. It can be one through a million. It can be one, two, or three. It's whatever you want it to be. So I'm going to say one means that that cost or benefit is not important. If I give it a 10, that means that is very important to me personally. And I want to say this. <clears throat> you do a cost benefit analysis probably a thousand times a day. You have little T charts going off in your brain constantly. You just don't sit down and write it out like we're getting ready to do. <clears throat> Every time you do something, <clears throat> what to eat for a snack, what to say to your significant other, what to do when you get home from work, uh, what time to go to bed, you always make a decision where the benefits outweigh the costs. And sometimes you probably have friends or colleagues or family members and they do things and you're just like, oh my gosh, why does that person keep doing that? Well, what you know is that there's a payoff. Kind of this is where psychology overlaps with economics. <clears throat> Whatever that person is doing, you don't have to know the details, but you can know for that person's unique situation, the benefits outweighing the costs. In fact, I used to teach, <clears throat> um, co-teach an economics course with the dean of um, the school I used to teach at. And it was the economics of terrorism, believe it or not. <clears throat> and economics will say that <clears throat> terrorists are rational decision makers because a rational decision simply means the benefits outweigh the costs for that person. And you, where we get in trouble, of course, not with terrorism, but where we get in trouble is with that family members, we impose our own little cost benefit analysis on a very simple or complex decision and assume that it looks the same and it doesn't, which is why these numbers are important. Okay, so you go through and you put down the cost of going to the beach for a long weekend. So some of the things, the disadvantages, I'm gonna have to use a credit card again. <clears throat> The high interest rate on my card, 24%, is going to end up making it more expensive than if I took the time to save some money. I'm just able to make ends meet as it is, so I'm not expecting any extra income to come in, so paying it off quickly, probably not going to happen. And then I'm almost at my $5,000 credit card max, so that's not good. <clears throat> However, the benefits is that I need a mental break. Getting away definitely will help, help me. Um, maybe I'll be more motivated to exercise by walking on the beach. I've got some friends who live nearby. And again, this is my personal analysis. You would do your own. And hey, I could save some money by eating breakfast and lunch in the room, in the hotel room. So if you look at this, you're like, um, I'm not sure what to do because it looks like the costs equal the benefits. Not so much. This is why we put the numbers in. <clears throat> Each of these things are not equally important. So you can see. <clears throat> the whole idea of using a credit card, I just gave it a three because, yeah, that's important, but it's not that important because I use my credit card to pay off a lot of things. But I gave the bottom one a 10, this whole notion of being close to my credit card max. That's a bigger deal to me, so I gave it a 10. You can see the mental health <clears throat> benefits. I'm going to give a 10 because it is time to take a break. Um, and then this whole notion, for example, that last one about eating breakfast in the room, I mean, really not going to save that much money. So I gave it a one. So when you do the math, you can see it's a pretty clear decision. The costs at 26 outweigh the benefits. And so the decision here would be not to go to the beach, <clears throat> the opportunity cost. So what does it cost me to not go to the beach is going to be this, the highest scoring um, benefit which i'm giving up by not going which happens to be the 10 which is this whole idea of feeling better getting away um 
from work in the neighborhood. So then I always put this in. What's the next step? Okay, so we're not going to the beach, but now let's go to the next step. Let's go find a cheaper but still fun alternative. All right, I'm going to fly through this one a little bit faster. <clears throat> but using an entrepreneurship example, same thing. Do I become an entrepreneur or not? You would go through what are the costs, what are the benefits, <clears throat> put some numbers to them. So for example, here, I'll just read my least scoring thing I give up is um, having to stay motivated. Look at the number one cost because no one's telling me what to do. Well, I'm an overachiever, which I'm always saying I'm a, a, in recovery. So I don't need people to tell me what to do. So I'm going to give that a one. Um, the I gave it a 10 because if this business fails, this could mean that my children don't eat, for example. The benefits, um, I gave all of them high scores because being my own boss is wonderful. And then the last one there, making a profit uh, not limited by what the employer pays me is important. And this is fictional. In fact, I don't even have children, so I'm just making this up. But when I do the math here, you can see that the benefits of becoming an entrepreneur are, almost, are, are double not being an entrepreneur. So based on this analysis, I should become an entrepreneur. <clears throat> I, it's going to cost me the opportunity to have that job security. If you look in the cost column, that thing that scored number 10, the whole idea of my family's economic well-being, that is potential, potentially an opportunity it may cost me by becoming an entrepreneur. So what we'll learn in the second half of today is entrepreneurship includes risk taking. And so naturally, the next step would be, OK, now, which business would I want to open? So here are different um, topics that you can apply a cost benefit analysis to when it comes to personal finance. So for example, should I get a payday loan near the bottom of the list there? Entrepreneurship, what is a part-time side hustle? You know, pressure washing, you may laugh at this, but I was gonna go into business with a friend of mine who's a teacher who makes more money pressure washing in the summer houses than he does teaching all year. And I love outdoor activities. And um, we are still talking about where I might be doing some pressure washing because I don't know many places where you can make about $300 for about an hour's worth of pressure washing per hour, $300 an hour. Like that's, that, that's pretty lucrative. I'm very entrepreneurial, not only in the educational world, but I'm constantly thinking about these ideas, which I should probably stop. But anyway, so you can apply a cost benefit analysis to so many different personal finance and entrepreneurship decisions. But what I want to share and then hear from you is here are some examples, for example, in US history, you could apply the cost benefit analysis to back in the day, invoking some historical empathy. What was the cost benefit analysis of going, uh, starting the civil war to end slavery? Geography, for example, what is, the cost benefit analysis of moving to Alaska, not like where all could we move for cold or climates. We have to remember, be specific. It's, it's to do or not to do. So to move to Alaska or not. <clears throat> Voting for President Biden if he runs again, not which candidate, it's only President Biden, costs and benefits of voting for him. And you can go all the way down. If you look at English, when we talk about, um, I have a lot, uh, no, not a lot, some English teachers that attend my entrepreneurship institutes because all of these subjects, particularly entrepreneurship and economics, apply to novels. Think about a main character, for example. You could do a cost benefit analysis on a decision made by a main character before you go on to the next chapter. So an English teacher could easily integrate a cost benefit analysis throughout the entire novel. Science, you know, in terms of renewable energy, what are the cost benefit, uh, cost and benefits of using windmills, which we're slowly moving towards. So those are some content examples. So now what I want to hear from you in just a second is um, where you might integrate a cost benefit analysis, but I want to leave you with this. So this cost benefit analysis can easily become a Google Doc where everybody is contributing at the same time and we would do this perhaps if we meet again for a more interactive webinar, <clears throat> everybody's typing costs and benefits for themselves. 
And then what we do is then everybody takes out a sheet of paper in person or online, doesn't matter. <clears throat> and then we're going to rate what we have collaboratively brainstormed as a group on this Google Doc and put now put our own personal ratings on a scale of one through 10. <clears throat> At the end of that, we would share out. And now we've got this really robust conversation of, OK, here's why I'm not going to do this. And here's X, Y and Z using something in that cost benefit column. You want to talk about a discussion starter. This is your best friend. <clears throat> and the other thing is don't limit this to just words. You can use it as a graphic organizer for primary and secondary sources. Maybe it's clip art. Maybe it's um, article links with a quick little summary to justify this position or this argument or this choice using the cost benefit analysis. So, so many ways to use this simple, simple tool. OK. In the chat box, Sharon, if you can help me kind of um, debrief, and it's okay, I know I'm giving a lot at once, and maybe you haven't had time to process it, but can you put in the chat box, and be, be careful, remember, it has to be a decision to do like one thing, one choice, one alternative, so word it in a way, maybe start with the, the word two, two blank, you don't have to put or not, but like two go to the beach, or two become an entrepreneur. Can you put in the chat box just a couple examples of either how you can integrate it into your own classroom, <clears throat> academic subjects, or how you might help your adult learners make better decisions when it comes to being uh, an employee of someone else's business or a citizen or, or, or a family member? Can you put those in the chat box now and then share and just read out a couple? I'm curious to, to hear. <clears throat> yeah, so it looks like to get your GED, to complete homework, to get vaccinated, to study online or go to an actual class, to apply for a new job, to goal set. Yeah, so lots of great stuff here. To pay for college, to change your housing, to go to school while working full time. Love it attend class on time, to work towards a certificate, to switch careers, to retire or not. Perfect. To take a payday loan, to take a yes. labor class. <clears throat> wow, that's exactly right. <clears throat> and so what we'll do if we meet again is we'll get into groups and brainstorm even further and then collectively put everyone's responses, for example, on that Jamboard or a Google Doc so that we can all walk away with like a hundred different examples. But that's exactly right. So hopefully you've gotten a little a sample of the cost benefit analysis tool. What I think I want to do now, looking at the time, Eastern time, it's 2.57. Let's take a quick 10 minute break and let me take a big spoon of honey to soothe my throat here. Um, and what I want to do is I'm going to put up the break slide with some motivational um, uh, sayings with a video that Sharon was lucky enough to get from a workforce development specialist in Detroit, Michigan, of this amazing success story. It's just one of hopefully a million um, of this young man who um, got a GED and started his own home improvement business. Like this is exactly like what I um, hope will come out of our time together, especially this second half when we talk more about entrepreneurship. So go ahead and take a quick break. Come back at, let's do 3.08. I'm going to um, step out as well after I put into the chat box the video that if you have a minute, watch. If not, you can watch it later. It's like a two-minute video. It won't take you long, but go take a break, and I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Oh, yikes. Somebody asked, when does this end? I, I hope that's not because it's so painful. This ends at uh, four o'clock. <clears throat> Sorry. It's probably all that coughing and clearing my throat that's so annoying. Okay. So there is the video of Mr. Young. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> would you like, are you playing it, Dr. Cheryl, or would you like me to? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. If you want to play it. Absolutely. I thought they were going to play it privately, but please absolutely do so. My name, Donald Young Jr. I am 25 years old. I'll be 26 December 7th this year. I just didn't have no interest in school. I had good grades, but I wasn't there sometimes. In my class, I'd be in somebody else's class. I'd be in the gym. You know, I never, I just wasn't doing what I supposed to be doing. It wasn't that I didn't know how to do the work. It was challenging me. It was just that I had other distractions. You know, people try to belittle you when they know you ain't got no, you know, high school diploma and stuff like that. They try to, you know, down talking, you know, you don't get the same as everybody else get, you know, when they got a diploma because they feel like you're not as smart and you can't prove it because, you know, you ain't got a high school diploma. So at the same time, you know, I just got had to make a better change for myself so everything can be a little better, you know. And then it was just for me, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to know I can do it, you know, boost my self-confidence and so I can open a few other doors at the same time. I would recommend it because it's a great program. You know, they helping you. Everybody talking about, you know, we ain't got no help or, you know, no kind of guidance, but it's like right here for real, you know? And it can take you a long way if you like, you know, use it and put your energy into it, you know, or figure out what you can do with it, you know? My company name is the Core Developments LLC. Um, we specialize in tub, tile, and countertop reglazing. The business is actually going good though. Um, I haven't been posting as much as I usually been posting because I really don't have to that much no more. But I don't think they really can find somebody that's like better than me for real. It's like they really care about the work and not gonna do you know whatever and make sure everything good. Especially the pricing. That's another thing. It's really the pricing. I don't know. They know I care about my work, though. That's definitely a factor. Certain things in my life I had to change, you know, certain ways I had to put to the side, you know, but I would like to thank Software Solutions, though, for all the help that they've been giving me, though. They definitely helped me get a long way and with my progress and all my changes, they definitely played a part in it.
All right, we've got about one minute. All right, 308. <clears throat> we are going to get started because we don't have a minute to spare. In fact, I was just looking over my slides. I'm going to have to go even faster. My apologies. But again, my whole point is if we never meet again, you will have everything you need to go slower when you have more time. So I have taken lots of honey to hopefully soothe my throat. I apologize. <clears throat> that is really something. I think I have something for show and tell I'm going to share with you here in a minute. And I think because it has collected dust in my room, I think that's the culprit. Anywho, we'll do the best we can. Again, my apologies. Let me take us back to <clears throat> tool number two. So we left with um, applications of a cost benefit analysis. This is your next best friend, the PASTO decision making model. Usually you see it as the acronym PACE, I added the O, you'll see why here in a minute, we're gonna fly through it. You will have this activity sheet in your Google Drive folder. So for our purposes, for this quick demonstration, I just want you to know that again, the uh, evaluation scale is arbitrary. I, this time I chose three, two, one, zero to keep the math simple. So when I use a three, this will make sense here in a minute, it means that the alternative under consideration or the choice meets the criteria or the goals by which we hope to achieve um, this decision making process is going to meet it very well and then a zero if this choice does not really accomplish what we're trying to do so hang on this will make sense in just a minute but the acronym is um, state the problem list the alternatives determine the criteria or things we hope to achieve at the end of the decision evaluate the alternatives in a way that's other than just eyeballing it and picking a, you know, a choice out of a hat. Let's put some numbers to it. Let's get a little bit more precise, make a decision. And then I added the O is because whenever, remember, you make a decision, fine if you want to make that decision, but let's be clear, help your adult learners be clear on what that decision costs them, not always in terms of money, but in terms of opportunities given up. Um, so this is not now what well, we just did cost benefit analysis. So to get a GED, for example, or to um, <clears throat> become an entrepreneur. Now it's, okay, where do I get my GED? Or what type of good or service should I sell? So now we're entertaining multiple choices at once against certain things we hope to achieve. <clears throat> And you'll see here in a minute that this also is a wonderful tool to <clears throat> determine whether or not your students have actually learned history, for example. You can't fill out one of these charts on the Civil War, for example, unless you really learned something along the way. So here it is. <clears throat> you can see I can't see the top of my screen here, but this is the personal finance. Oh, so this is the one about, so we're not going to the beach, too expensive. <clears throat> so let's still do something fun. Um, and the new alternatives that should be a little bit cheaper, but hopefully still fun. We're gonna consider camping at the lake, <clears throat> going to the public pool, pretend it's summer, <clears throat> and then uh, maybe getting that old slip and slide. Those of you my, around my age, you might remember that yellow strip. We're gonna put that on our list of uh, ways to have fun. Now, here's what I hope to accomplish by making this decision. So my criteria is I need it to be the least expensive possible. <clears throat> I wanna have the most fun possible. And at, at 51, I need something to be a little safer than maybe in my 20s. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each alternative and weigh it up against each criteria. So. <clears throat> Those are our values, three, two, zero, one, <clears throat> or one, zero. So camping at the lake, I'm going to give it a one because it sort of kind of is least expensive. It kind of meets that 
criteria, but it's still going to be a little bit expensive. <clears throat> You know, I'm not really a lake person, so I'm not making all of this up, but I love the lake. But um, so I'm going to give it a two. I'm going to have fun, but it's not like it's going to be the most fun I've ever had. <clears throat> and then safety, yeah, it's pretty safe. Uh, as long as you don't <clears throat> step on something sharp in the water that you can't see through. So I'm going to give it a two. <clears throat> the public pool is about the same. Now, the slip and slide, I'm going to give it a three because that definitely meets the criteria of least expensive. I think they sell for $20 or less. I'm gonna give it a three in terms of fun because if I remember correctly, that was a lot of fun. But <clears throat> at 51, I'm giving it a one because the last thing I need is to injure myself, hurt my back, my old knee injury from back in my athlete days. I don't need anything to go wrong. So I'm gonna give it a one in terms of safety because it doesn't really meet the criteria of safety very well. So then you add them up to uh, one plus two plus two is five. Two plus two plus two is six, <clears throat> etc. <cetera. clears throat> and it looks like based on the highest scoring alternative, which is a seven, it looks like we should be getting that slip and slide. As always, we want to be cognizant of, okay, we'll get the slip and slide, but it cost us the opportunity to go to the pool, which is our second highest scoring alternative. <clears throat> so think for a minute, why is this analysis not as precise as it could be. Well, I'll take some more water. <clears throat> so are all of the criteria equally as important to me, do you think? No, typically it's not. When you think about, for example, let's say the alternatives or which school to go to or which career <clears throat> to pursue. On the top column, for example, going to a university or getting a career, you know, money might be the most important criteria. Location, <clears throat> fun, all of that might be secondary. So we have to find a way mathematically to tease out the importance of each of these criteria. And what we're gonna do is on a scale of one through 100, which brings in percentages in relativity, we're going to assign each of the criteria on a scale of one through 100, how important is this criteria of it being the least expensive to me? So I'm going to say about 20% of my decision, I want to accomplish this criteria of being the least expensive. <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to give most fun 10% because I can kind of have fun anywhere, and this is true to life for me. <clears throat> But as I mentioned, I've got some um, old injuries that I cannot afford literally to miss work and be in the hospital for. So of this decision, safety is 70% of what I hope to achieve. <clears throat> so what you do is you take the numbers and we just do some simple math. 20 times one is 20, 10 times two is 20, <clears throat> 70 times two is 140, you do the same for the next two alternatives. And now look, we've got bigger numbers, more precise analysis. And lo and behold, I'm so glad we did the more precise number crunching because it turns out we're going to the public pool instead of that old slip and slide. <clears throat> but you'll see here that the opportunity cost will be the second highest scoring alternative. So based on this analysis, when we go to the public pool, it cost us the opportunity to go camping at the lake. So if this is new to you, this is gonna take a minute to sink in, <clears throat> but of course we don't have a minute. So come back to this and um, kind of go back through it, just like we're doing, push play on the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Here's an example of what you could do with your students. I've given you an entrepreneurship example as well. So have your students do this after you get comfortable with it. So the question is, pretend you're an entrepreneur. And now let's figure out what good or service you wanna sell. <clears throat> and lots of times when your students haven't done a lot of thinking about how they could be an entrepreneur, you have to give them some examples. So over in the services column, that usually requires the least amount of startup costs. <clears throat> Maybe you just want to go rake leaves or um, shovel snow, pull some weeds. I could use some help with that in my yard and get paid to do it. But to determine 
which one you should do, you have to kind of factor in like, okay, what do you enjoy? What is your skill set? So <clears throat> here's another example. I'm just going to go through quickly. Let's say we're going to consider that pressure washing, which I was serious about. Lawn mowing and then interior house painting. <clears throat> Let's say that the criteria I personally hope to achieve would be I want to enjoy it if possible. I want to make some dollars. And I kind of sort of need it to be year round. And once again, when we go through and do the numbers on that first go round, it looks like we should do the pressure washing, <clears throat> which cost us the opportunity to do interior painting. Well, not so fast. When we put in those weighted criteria on a scale of one through 100, bringing in the relativity of percentages, I've decided that, okay, uh, enjoyment is about 20% important to me. 30% is making the money, but here's the thing. I'm not just broke in the summertime. I need money all year round. So when you go back through and put the new numbers in, so for example, the pressure washing, you pretty much can't do that in the winter. So it changes all the numbers and it changes the outcome, which means we really should pursue interior house painting and the opportunity cost there is now the pressure washing. So you can see, again, coming back full circle, <clears throat> these tools help make a more informed, thus empowered decision that will hopefully lead to a higher achievement score <clears throat> or better life decisions. I'm gonna skip some of this. Here are some content examples. So for example, the geography, now it's not whether we're moving to Alaska or not, what's the cost and benefits, it's now, <clears throat> let's consider several states that have a colder climate at the same time. And then for civics, it's not, are we going to vote for Biden or not, here are his advantages and disadvantages. Now it's, let's put all of the politicians in the alternatives column. Let's put on the criteria, the things we hope that politician will achieve if elected <clears throat> and run some numbers. So we are gonna skip this, but think back to whatever your example for the cost benefit analysis was, <clears throat> and now figure out how that would be um, useful in a PASTO decision-making model. So now it's not just one choice or alternative. You would entertain multiple within that same subject area or that same life decision at the same time. And that honey did not help. <clears throat> My apologies. If anybody has a remedy for whatever's going on here, this is not common for me. Put that in the chat box and Sharon, please share that with me. <laughs> Tool number three, I'm going to be brief. These are some basic principles. Um, this is really the verbal qualitative interpretation of the first two skills. So cost benefit analysis, PASTO, graphic organizers, numbers involved. This is now for your right brain verbal learner where you take these very simple principles, like for principle number four, <clears throat> choices have intended and unintended consequences in the future. So whenever you make a decision, it would be good to think about that economic principle. <clears throat> or this, these, these are the writing prompts I use at the university level when we bring in current events. They have to read the current event, which typically doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them off the bat. But once they use these principles and kind of answer some, and it's okay if you don't can't read them, <clears throat> some of the, the, the prompts under each of those four main economic principles, when they answer those questions and write me a nice essay response on what this current event is saying, this really helps like tease out the important pieces <clears throat> for any article, not just economic related articles. <clears throat> I also do a wonderful national webinar on using these principles to cultivate more civil dialogue between citizens, which is hard to come by, it seems like these days. <clears throat> so whenever you debate an extremely emotionally charged topic, when you use these four principles as the lens through which you make your arguments, you take some of the emotion out and you have a better outcome. Another powerful use of this tool. 
personal finance. So this one, <clears throat> I'm going to go faster because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for entrepreneurship. The reason is personal finance is usually, um, most people understand it better than economics and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> and also because COAP, Sharon has been instrumental in bringing the Entrepreneurship Institute, which is a 40 hour deep dive into it. I want to, like I've just reframed economics for you, hopefully, <clears throat> I want to kind of desensitize the topic of entrepreneurship so that when you make that economic choice to attend or not attend, <clears throat> you understand what that institute's about. Uh, because it's probably not going to be about what you might initially think, just like with this whole discipline of economics. <clears throat> so this slide here is a good reminder of every time you make a choice, so you spend your money on buying a new used vehicle, it costs you the opportunity to go on vacation. This is a wonderful slide on thinking about unexamined spending habits, which the average family wastes about 30% of its income by just not really knowing where the money is going month after month. And if you can get control of it, it is the same as giving yourself a 30% pay raise. So think about it. If you're able to be a little bit smart, not you per se, but I'm saying your students, us in general, <clears throat> about where you're spending your money on a daily basis, like that Starbucks coffee, if you can get control over that 30% of wasteful spending, you've just increased your salary by 30%. So here's an example that runs through this whole notion of eating out three lunches a week or going by Starbucks for five coffees a week. It goes through the math, wonderful math activity. And it ends up showing, if you look at the one, two, three, four, fifth column over, three lunches a year, and take time to do the math with, with your students, ends up costing you about $1,500. Five coffees a week costs you about $500. So, the whole key with personal finance when it's taught in an empowering way it's not about you know not ever eating out or never getting that coffee but let's now look at this idea of a reduction plan not elimination plan what would it cost for one lunch or two coffees and you can see if you uh, run the numbers the potential savings per year and the whole idea is having them realize how might you better use this money than spend it on lunches and coffees Another important basic thing, and again, I'm just giving you snippets of the curriculum, 12-hour curriculum, that I think make wonderful math activities, for example, is this whole idea of unit prices. So if you tease out what one ounce, a little handful of pretzels is from Costco versus Food Lion versus <clears throat> ordering it through Amazon versus getting it at a vending machine, you can see that the price changes for that same one ounce of pretzels. This is important <clears throat> for a lot of people who don't understand it or haven't taken the time to realize it. So here's a nice quick example. You always think that the cheaper one is a better value. Not really when we do the unit pricing, it turns out <clears throat> buying the larger one is better. This is a wonderful video. You have to come back. It's, it's, a, it's really comical. But it talks about the psychology of how a grocery store is laid out. When you go from aisle to aisle, it's really good. You'll have to watch it. And this whole question about when you go shopping, how do you decide what to buy? Look at what's in parentheses. That is just economics 101 that we just went over. That's how you make spending decisions. And so... <clears throat> big picture, when you teach personal finance, really have them unpack, not like, oh, that's a good decision, that's a bad decision. Like, let's talk about why. You know, why does your spouse make certain decisions with the, the bank account? It really might save a lot of arguments as well. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so, again, doing some number crunching, want to be clear on uh, which is the better value because... Um, we talk about supply and demand. The price of something is the incentive to buy it or not to buy it. And incentives like scarcity are like two of the five primary drivers of economics in personal finance and in entrepreneurship as well. Incentives are key. Even the government knows how to incentivize human behavior, which is economics. <clears throat> 
I think this is a good um, illustration of compound interest. I'm not going to go through it. You probably understand it, but here's a nice little video. It's hard to find interest um, simplified in these basic numbers, but the video recaps what's on the slide there. So I think that'll make a nice um, learning activity for your students. This is a nice little slide where the, the, the number crunching has been done for you. But if you look at the $500 tax refund, if you save it one time in say a CED <clears throat> for that 2% interest, in 30 years, that one tax refund, and it's not like you can always save those tax refunds, I get it. But that one year where you saved it, it ends up being $20,000 towards retirement in 30 years. Think about if you save that $500 tax refund for 10 years in a row. A lot of people call the uh, compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. And don't forget about your mathematical learners. Show numbers and graphs when possible. <clears throat> Always being clear on sales. When we use a credit card, that 20% off TV, assuming you can't pay it off, and you, you can go back and read through. Don't, don't be so concerned about reading what's on the chart, but I wanted you to have it so you can unpack it slowly with your students, unlike we're doing together. But that second to last column on the right, if it takes you five years to pay it off, it's not really a deal because now <clears throat> that $625 TV that was on sale for 500 really cost you almost $900. So it's really important to kind of help your students think through what you're getting into when you use a credit card, for example, and you can't pay it off, which most people can't, I think, cannot. This is a nice um, topic for teaching pie charts and percentages. Good little video using there are different scores to um, evaluate your credit score. FICA score is the most common one used, I think, still today. Good to talk about. 35% of that score comes from just paying your bills on time, even if it's a partial payment. So a good way to increase that credit score, which could have a ripple effect on a lot of other spending decisions. <clears throat> All right. Entrepreneurship. I did it. It's 3.30. We got 30 minutes. Hopefully everybody's doing okay. I haven't seen too many people drop off. Any pressing questions before we finish up strong? Okay. We'll have some time at the end. So one of the questions I am seeing, Cheryl, yeah. is with regard to how to motivate adult learners in this area. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay, man. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so here's the thing. <clears throat> this is sort of the power behind these three subjects. And I think it's what it's made my life easier than most is because whenever you're talking about people's money, they kind of perk up. Whenever you're talking about having a dream job where you're making more money than you could working for someone else doing what you love, people perk up. And that's sort of why using these topics as the lens through which to teach math not so exciting science not always exciting social studies that's kind of what ups your game and keeps them more engaged that has been shown through the research k-12 unfortunately not much research has been done maybe i can do it uh in the future but in terms of the the adult ed world but again humans are humans motivation is motivation and so i think you'll find by just trying to integrate this content into your less exciting programs, classes, topics might help uh, with the motivation. Okay, speaking of motivation, you know, IETs, which I'm really fascinated in Virginia, we're hoping to create an official entrepreneurship IET, and you know better than me. And again, so I've always been at the university K-12 level, and so I am slowly learning. What I have learned about adult ed is that you all, I think, have more acronyms than we do at the university K-12 level. So I'm kind of learning everything. Hopefully I haven't misspoken too much with you today, <clears throat> but I am digging an IET in entrepreneurship. And so we're gonna try to develop it here in Virginia over the next year, starting with the Entrepreneurship Institute that Sharon and CoA have graciously agreed to sponsor. Again, more on that here momentarily. But it is the perfect way to teach those um, core subjects 
get them ready for the workforce. Forget about starting a business, getting them ready to be that rock star employee that knows how a business runs, even if they're working for someone else. And becoming perhaps an entrepreneur long term. And I just wanted to say that WIOA, thankfully, allows entrepreneurship um, as a subject that it, that they support it. And again, I've had to learn more about my dream in starting this economic empowerment project about four years ago was to bring adult educators and workforce de development folks together, reduce some of that waste and overlap between the two adult services. Um, and I know that's still a struggle, but it is um, an allowable activity under WIOA, in case that's important. <clears throat> so what is an entrepreneur? <clears throat> again, not a lot of time for interaction, but I like this definition because, again, the next 20 minutes, I want to try to reframe for you, like I tried to do with economics, what entrepreneurship is about. I want you to forget about this, quit your day job, start a brick and mortar coffee shop. Forget about that for a minute. So an entrepreneur disrupts the status quo. <clears throat> That's powerful in and of itself. To solve problems by taking a risk to make a profit so that people's lives are improved. <clears throat> so an entrepreneur wears these glasses and looks around the world and doesn't see, oh gosh, look at that problem over there. Oh my gosh, look over there. An entrepreneur, it's called opportunity recognition, looks for what we call pain points of the human experience and go, oh my gosh, I could do that better. Oh, look over there. Look at that problem. That's an opportunity for me to offer blah, blah, blah. So an entrepreneur, some would argue and some argue not, that it's somewhat of a hero, you know, trying to help people. And again, money, some people are overcome by the money. So that's that. But a lot of people are trying to really make life better for other people. And that's the kind of entrepreneurship <clears throat> I like to teach. In fact, this little video <clears throat> is a wonderful four minute um, animated explanation of entrepreneurship really being about the heart than it is about the money. So do come back and watch that. And if you didn't already know, Pharrell Williams and Jay-Z during COVID created this wonderfully inspiring music video. I don't know if you've heard the song. I had not heard it on the radio. But COVID, in a nutshell, made people realize that being able to think like an entrepreneur, meaning to turn on a dime when unexpected challenges come our way as COVID presented for almost everyone, to be able to innovate, recreate, ideate, pivot, all entrepreneurship words, to make the most out of the situation. And so a lot of business leaders, corporations have realized that we need people to have more entrepreneurial skills, whether they start a business or not for instances like COVID. So watch that video. I always just wanna tell you, if you sign up for the Institute, <clears throat> it is not, this is not how I roll anyway. It is not about trying to start a corporate 500 company in New York City. That's maybe step 100. Most of us will never get that and really don't wanna get that. But, so that is not what I mean by entrepreneurship. Um, Nifty, has a wonderful interactive that I hope you'll go back. They have identified through research eight core skill sets or competencies <clears throat> that we need in the 21st century workforce innovation gig economy, also called the shared economy. And here they are. Who wouldn't benefit, whether you start a business or not, by gaining these eight skill sets? So definitely come back and take a look at that. Part A of the Institute, I call the entrepreneurial mindset because we focus a lot on these skill sets. And here's the thing that almost brings me to tears and probably has before, but entrepreneurship characteristic skills is really life 101. And this is why the research is clear <clears throat> that entrepreneurship is one of the most effective, long-term, impactful game changers in impoverished areas. Because starting a business, and trust me, the last four years of this economic empowerment project has been painful, 
It's about overcoming obstacles, learning from failure, refusing to have a victim mindset. Think, I mean, this 409 I love is the, the, there were two scientists in Detroit, Michigan. Hopefully we'll connect over a 409 bottle for many years to come. Think of me when you see it or think of the entrepreneurs in the United States. <clears throat> it took them 408 reformulations of this cleaner. It, they had to fail 408 formulations. They were scientists. I don't even understand it. Don't need to understand it before they came up with the 409th formula that's made them, of course, probably million billionaires. So entrepreneurship teaches these life skills apart from career and businesses that are just profound. Um, calculated risk taking. And look at the other one, self-efficacy. I saw once that entrepreneurship, when you are able to become a successful, and I'm not, I don't mean this jokingly, because we talk about being a dog walker, being someone who sets up a, a community um, bake stand at the community market. Uh, I'm talking about simple jobs, that pressure washing business that my uh, teacher friend does, mowing lawns. That really empowers people. It gives them self-worth. It gives them purpose. Entrepreneurship has been proven to help people stay out of uh, addiction recovery programs because rather than signing them up for a job at the local food line stocking shelves, which probably most people don't enjoy, they are in, in, um, encouraged to create and follow their passions and their talents and their skills and what people have said they do well in a way that keeps them engaged, back to the engagement question. Entrepreneurship, I mean, I, I, I definitely think it's the golden ticket and I totally disclose that I'm highly biased. However, there's a lot of research that supports it. And we won't take time, but I hope you'll do this. In terms of thinking like an entrepreneur, again, not trying to be on Wall Street, this is about being resourceful with things that you have. We call it bootstrapping. And an easy thing to do, which we typically do but don't have time today, is look at the things you have around your house. Think for a minute, just to yourself, what if you became, if you became kind of um, up against the wall, what could you do to make some money? And maybe these items aren't for you, but I mean, I'll say I should stop cutting my own hair, which I cut off and save a lot of money that way. I'm not saying it works. But maybe you do have a knack for cutting hair. <clears throat> maybe you can walk, go to a, a more affluent part of your city and offer to walk dogs for busy, busy young couples with children who don't have time. They're washing a car, for example. So use this little activity for kind of innovation, creativity, but to really get them to think, oh my gosh, if I, got, if I lost my job, what could I do? This is too beautiful, and I think it was well worth all the coughing because once you realize, so this right here is made out of trash. Um, <clears throat> a lady I know was a lawyer. She gave it up to go to Uganda and helps these women become entrepreneurs, literally making treasures out of trash. So this uh, necklace I don't wear because it's so precious to me. If you'll see, the beads are gorgeous. It sits in my room just kind of as a, a beautiful little decoration, which I think this is the thing that collected dust and has been making me cough. So my apologies, but it's worth it. I also bought that basket that they make out of banana peels. But so taking it from an international perspective, it's about having people affirm what they already bring to the table in terms of their human capital, and also things that they already have. You don't have to take out a loan to necessarily start a business. We'll talk more about that at the Institute, but here's a wonderful activity that I hope you'll do. <clears throat> Again, keeping both sides of the entrepreneurship coin in play here. So an entrepreneur, this is someone who sees problems or gaps in services <clears throat> at, in the workplace and translates them into opportunities. The entrepreneur is more in the for-profit marketplace, but again, creating value for an employer in the workplace or creating value in the marketplace for the rest of us who buy the goods and services. So a quick thing, this is called ideation. It's a step in the design thinking process, which is part of the Institute. We go into design thinking, which is not just for starting business. It actually started in the sciences. But the easy thing you could do is, okay, 
And if we get together again for the live interactive, we'll do this in small groups. We'll put you into breakout rooms. But think about, okay, what is constantly bugging you? What is your pain point? What frustrates you on a daily basis? It's called opportunity recognition. And so when we talk about the workplace, maybe it's this notion of having to pay for childcare so that you can stay after work and complete a training. Maybe for the marketplace, it's uh, rural areas like around Virginia Tech where there is no safe and efficient transportation for people to get to work. There's only three questions. Here's the second. Okay, so how is it currently being solved, if at all? Maybe in the workplace, a lot of people miss those trainings or they have to suck it up and pay those expensive babysitter costs. Not ideal. <clears throat> for the transportation, okay, you could call a taxi if they're available. It could take a long time for them to get to you and you could also have some unfriendly service. And so here's where the entrepreneurial um, juices get flowing. Okay. So what could we do to solve the problem better to help people out? When we talk about being an entrepreneur and using these entrepreneurial skills, maybe it's, okay, let's pay a licensed child care provider to come and be on site and we bring our children and we pay that person, we pool our money, and now we've got quality child care. And don't we wish we were all Uber? to come up with that whole system of better, more reliable transportation. <clears throat> so we won't um, do this performance task, but if we get back together, we will. You'll be amazed at what comes out of these little activities. Um, and some of, uh, so I've been running that institute for a few years and have graduated quite a few people. And I would say 25% of the teachers, adult educators that go through it, end up starting the, the side hustle that they use um, to run through the activity. So what you'll do at the end of it is you will have a full-fledged business plan because you'll pretend, I'm all about experiential learning, you'll pretend that you are your student and you'll walk through, for example, the different business plan templates that I've uh, created. <clears throat> and you could technically take that to the bank and get a loan, but that's not the point. I just want you to experience what it feels like to make a, a, a pretty comprehensive, but still simple business plan. And then the part A, the entrepreneurial mindset, we all create a multidisciplinary lesson to where you can integrate this entrepreneurial mindset, skill set into other subjects. <clears throat> and this is one of the activities, how we kind of get the juices flowing. So um, I'm going to leave you with this um, one pager. I'm all about the one pagers. So this is a good sheet to use with your students. If, for example, again, we never meet, I uh, want you to at least have this. So the entrepreneur characteristics, I've hyperlinked in that handout, that activity sheet, which you'll get through the Google Drive folder. A wonderful short video that talks about what's required to be an entrepreneur and then the second one is a little bit longer it goes over 15 characteristics and what i like about these videos and there are many in fact if you complete the institute you will have over 400 real world resources to teach anything and everything entrepreneurship at its basic level so these videos are of course Part of that 400 plus list <clears throat> but what i like about these videos is because it kind of presents it in a way that empowers back to that question students who aren't engaged students who have never been told they're going to amount to anything because you can see um for example that that it, again you can come back the, the 15 characteristics if you move on down it says you know you're insecure you get into hot water a lot you're fearless you can't sit still um, you're an outsider. It really validates a lot of the things that the world tells people are not positives. And it's just oh, it's so affirming. Again, my whole thing is just to make people stand up a little taller and just feel a little bit better. That's kind of where everything starts and makes me sad that a lot of people have not had that. Um, and so the second column there is human capital. This goes to the US Department of Labor's competency models. It's hyperlinked there. And it gives you wonderful examples about personal effectiveness, which I know you all integrate apart from entrepreneurship, academic skills, workplace skills that entrepreneurs need. 
and it gives you uh, wonderful definitions. It gives you little check sheets. You'll definitely want to use that to build that human capital. Um, and then the last two columns, again, this is just kind of a brainstorming, you know, affirming, feel good. Let's motivate people like they deserve to be motivated. You know, first thing is, what do you do well? What would someone say, and don't bring this up if, if, they, if you don't think people have given them compliments, but you know, what do people say? What does your family, what do your neighbors, what do your friends say that you're good at? And then the second one, okay, and if that's not appropriate, then again, you can delete and cut paste these activity sheets to meet your audience. Uh, and use this on a one-on-one -on -one counseling. Sit down with someone. This doesn't have to be a classroom setting per se. <clears throat> what are some of the things you love to do? And then that last column, okay, back to entrepreneurship on the job. What are some things at your workplace that you could maybe bring up to a supervisor um, and say, hey, wonder if we did X, Y, and Z, might that help profits or whatever? Again, entrepreneurship creates better workers for other people as well. <clears throat> and then the entrepreneurship, I'm sorry, entrepreneurship would be, all right, so here are the things you're good at. Here's maybe some things you've done in the past. Here's what you like to do. Now, how can we kind of repackage all of that and make some money at the same time? That's how you build an entrepreneurship venture. And this dream sheet, <clears throat> um, you can go through and read. This is kind of what we call a modified, a lean canvas. It's, it's pretty close, but it's a little more simplified and rightly so for someone just kind of <clears throat> toying with the idea of uh, creating that lawn care business, for example, and just to start thinking through some of the, the pieces of what that business would look like, culminating with, we do this in both part A and part B of the Institute, but um, uh, pitching the idea to customers, to lenders, if you can't bootstrap your resources, to hiring employees. So it, it's a nice little activity. It'll make sense when you have time to go through it. If not, email me. So I'm going to leave you with um, just some examples in particular on entrepreneurship, just to kind of um, hopefully raise an eyebrow um, for you in terms of how entrepreneurship can be so relevant in both the multidisciplinary classroom as well as Life 101. So here it is, and I'll go through it really quickly. Let me check my time. Yep, 11 minutes. Let me check my PowerPoint slides. I can't believe I caught us up. We are good. This is the last technical slide. So here we go. <clears throat> so entrepreneurship um, is starts with opportunity recognition. <clears throat> so when we talk about science, maybe it's um, thinking about or recognizing opportunities to recycle more in the local community. As it pertains to the life decisions, Enrolling in a GED program, help becoming aware of the opportunity to complete that GED like we saw Mr. Young in that video. Problem solving, social studies. Thinking about a social issue that maybe the majority of your students are passionate about. Okay, let's stop complaining about this problem. How can we might, how might we solve it in some small ways or big ways? When it comes to life, Maybe on the job, you are um, a waitress or a waiter and you decide that, hey, to your boss who owns the restaurant, how about we start some home delivery in this season of COVID when people aren't coming in? Again, problem solving as an entrepreneur for someone else. Lean Canvas, that's that graphic organizer dream sheet I just showed you. It's a wonderful exercise in pricing products and then calculating the revenue, which we'll talk about in the Institute. That Lean Canvas though, I love it because uh, it's a graphic organizer like the cost benefit analysis and like the pace of decision-making model. And it kind of keeps everything in one place. And so I think it's encouraging to just, you can um, cut and paste and delete those little squares and put different things like plans after GED, get a job, get a four-year degree, start a family. You can change those little squares around remember this here? Doesn't have to be about a business, but you could use that, for example, it's still called a lean canvas for what to do after getting a GED. The marketing plan that we do in the Institute, that's persuasive writing 101. Whenever you're going to market something you're trying to sell, you become uh, a persuader, and that makes a wonderful writing prompt for English. Personal branding, 
you can sell your products, for example, but you sell yourself every time you show up to a meeting, every time you show up to a job interview, every time you show up to a date. So what is your personal brand? You know, are you honest and fun loving? I mean, are you hardworking and ethical? So we do a little bit of that in terms of the personal branding, always connecting the dots between economics, entrepreneurship, and personal finance to multidisciplinary classrooms and life 101. And that's the beauty of the three subjects. Famous entrepreneurs and inventions, maybe in your social studies subject, you take a look at the industrial revolution and you just kind of unpack, okay, what did the, and I hope I'm getting this right because history is not my strong suit, you know, uh, the cotton gin, um, what did it, what problem did it solve? Kind of working backwards, taking any modern day, the clothes hanger, think about a clothes hanger. Wow. Well, that solves the problem by keeping the clothes from getting wrinkled. But what a simple but powerful invention that has stood the test of time, like the wheel. And then in terms of connecting, connecting it to life, famous entrepreneurs, back to the motivation question. When you study, for example, Elon Musk is really kind of hot in the high school classrooms. Everyone's in love with Elon Musk and, and for some obvious reasons um, in terms of his whole SpaceX program and the Tesla, which is really um, coming a long way. He's now working on the, 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 the self-driving car. So that's motivation. Some of the teachers, high school teachers tell me their kids kind of perk up when they start studying about these entrepreneurs that they, they look up to. The elevator pitch, that's that two to three minute that you see on the shark tank, but that's pretty scary. We're not really ready for that. But when we talk about, you know, pitching your side of any argument, so bringing in the science sciences, you know, if you're going to talk about UFOs, let's like be persuasive and give that pitch in an informed way in the classroom. Using an elevator pitch, maybe you want to convince your spouse to get that slip and slide or go to the beach. So you're always pitching your ideas doesn't have to just be for a business. And finally, when we talk about pivoting, that's when an entrepreneur um, realizes that the goods and services that they've tested out on what we call customer discovery on a subset of customers, looks like, okay, no, nobody really wants this. Um, you have to pivot. So you either um, kind of tweak the features and benefits of a product or you just start all over from scratch and offer something to call that pivoting like in basketball. Um, and in life, maybe it's time to pivot from your old group of uh, friends to a new group of friends if they're not being positive influences or building you up. So, again, all sorts of real world applications in the classroom and in life when it comes to entrepreneurship. So five minutes left. This is the curriculum that these slides come from. It's 12 hours, it's three and a half on uh, economics, three and a half on personal finance, three and a half on entrepreneurship. Some of what you'll see is what we did today. Um, I am finishing up the December, January cohort. I'm gonna offer it again because it was so popular. It's been field tested in person, which is my, I, you know, I um, would love to do any of this in person. My, I think, um, competitive advantage is in person because I don't think I do so well, especially when I'm coughing constantly online. So happy to do um, these programs in person if my schedule will allow. But I put this online because I kept getting requests from states. So I did it in North Carolina, Arizona, and of course, Virginia, where we piloted it. Um, with some immigrants in Northern Virginia, for example, who had to bring a translator and they still felt empowered by it. But um, you can sign up for this. Um, there'll be a flyer in the Google Drive folder if you're interested, but it's all asynchronous, but there'll be an optional three one hour Zoom classes where we can get together and I can put you into small groups where you can actually discuss the, the curriculum like we may do as a follow up to this through CoAid. And then here's the big the big one that um, Sharon has been so awesome in terms of promoting. So this is the Online Entrepreneurship Institute that's, um, I think it's in my year three I created. It took me a couple years to collect those 400 resources. So part A, I realize not everybody wants to commit the full 40 hours, um, but so I've divided it up into five weeks for 20 hours on that entrepreneurial mindset. That's more the philosophical underpinning, underpinnings on what we've kind of gone through today. 
So it has many, many applications. And then part B is more the nuts and bolts. That's um, the, the full-fledged business plan you'll leave with um, as you work through the content. And we do meet weekly. So it's half online, half live with me and others in breakout groups. I invite guest speakers, local homegrown. In fact, that young man we saw in the video, I hope he'll be one of the guest speakers where they do like a 20 minute presentation on lessons learned by starting a business. And then there's about 10 minutes for Q&A where you could ask some questions. That flyer is also, um, that's gonna be capped out. We're about half full. I think I wanna limit it to 50 people. Um, so if you're interested, it is, um, so I didn't put any prices because I hate charging, but I typically have funded all of my work through grants and through COVID. I could not get people to pay the registration fees, these foundations. So there are fees for this and I apologize in advance, but I am currently only working part-time. And so I have to, of course, still pay bills as well. But anywho, take a look at that. Email me if you have any questions. I see we've got the poll up. Gosh, I certainly hope I have exceeded some expectations today. And I've got two minutes. Um, just wanna encourage you to, at every opportunity, include the economics, personal finance and entrepreneurship in a way that again, coming back to the objectives for today, improves achievement in the GED um, uh, goals in your adult learners lives in their life. And then of course, just developing them into a better workforce for the benefit of all of us. There's my email, reach out uh, Cheryl42 at VT for virginiatech.edu. There's my website. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and put this um, link to the Google Drive folder in the chat box when I start unwinding here. But you'll also get a follow up email from CoAbe um, with this link in case you had to check out early or don't access it here in the next few minutes. And then I'm going to hang around for questions or comments after I get this link in the chat box. And that is it. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your patience with my coughing. And I'm so sorry about that, but I hope that something today will help make your life easier and, and empower your adult learners. So Cheryl and everybody, thank you so much. Um, Cheryl, thank you for sharing your expertise and um, your knowledge with us. And I see the, the responses for the poll, they're coming back beautifully. So. Good. Um, really appreciate your time. I see folks following us. So I just want to say thank you to those who have joined us. Everybody, we have been going, I've been going through the questions. Those that uh, Dr. Ayers can answer, I'll send on to her and we can include it in the, the re report out to everybody. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Thank you for taking your time with us today. Thank, thank you, you, Sharon. Sharon. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to put this um, link in the chat box and then that'll be that. Okay, all right. Let's make sure somebody click on that and make sure that somebody can open it. I did. It looks great. Perfect. Take care, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye now. Bye bye.